Jesus said in John 17, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The essence of eternal life is knowing Christ, having Jesus within the heart. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Jesus says, well, Jesus was uh, approached by a young man. And he said, now behold, one came and said to him, speaking to Jesus, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? What do you think of that question? Is that a good question? That is a good question. We need to know what we have to do to have everlasting life. However, from the question, you can get where his emphasis was, What good thing must I do to have everlasting life? Well, Jesus responded and said to him, Why do you call me good? There is one that is good. That is God. If you want to enter into life, Jesus said, keep the commandments. So some important points from this passage of Scripture. Number one, the ruler recognized his spiritual need. He was zealous for doing good things, and yet he still felt that there was something lacking in his life. There was an emptiness. There was a hungering. There was a thirsting of soul, and he thought maybe Jesus could help him. So he came to Jesus, and he said, what must I do? What good thing must I do to have everlasting life? Jesus emphasized his own divinity when he responded and said, Why do you call me good? There is one that is good, and that is God. Now remember the young man, rich young ruler, said to Jesus, Good teacher. Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There is only one that's good, and that is God. Now I think it's significant because not only does the young man referred to Jesus as good teacher, but the young man asks, what good thing must I do? Now follow me closely. Only he who is good can do that which is good. The reason the young man could not do anything that was good enough in order for him to enter into the kingdom was because he was not good. But Jesus is good. God is good. God is able to do a good work in us that enables us to enter the kingdom. And Jesus was wanting to emphasize this to the young man. Point number three, Jesus directed him to the law to see his need. Now the Apostle Paul tells us that the law is our teacher to bring us to Christ. And so Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Could the young man keep the law? Not on his own. No, it had to be Christ keeping the law in him and through him. But Jesus wanted the young man to realize that. And he said unto him, which ones? The young man speaking. Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now something interesting about the list that Jesus gives. This is not all of the Ten Commandments, obviously. It's just really the last six. It has to do with his relationship to his fellow man. Now, it's interesting that Jesus uses these five commandments, and then he summarizes the sixth one, and we'll look at that in just a minute. He uses these commandments and says, this is what you need to do. Well, what about the first four? Well, the first four have to do with our relationship with God, but Jesus doesn't even go there. He begins with this man's relationship to his fellow man. And the one commandment that's left out, which is number ten, has to do with covetousness. Jesus summarizes the Tenth Commandment by simply saying, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't covet that which is your neighbor's. And if you don't covet that which is your neighbor's, you won't steal or kill or commit adultery. You will honor your parents. So Jesus put it this way for a reason. A couple of points on this. The Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. Jesus summarized as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, our love for others, why did Jesus quote these last six? Our love for others reveals our love for God. And here's the verse. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If somebody says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Now Jesus knew that it was easy for the young man to deceive himself into thinking that he loves God. So Jesus doesn't even go there. Jesus says, do you love your fellow man? You see, if you really love your fellow man, yes, you love God. How often people walk around talking about how much they love God, 
but they hate their fellow man. We can deceive ourselves into thinking that we love God, but the evidence of love for God will be manifest in love for our fellow man. That's why Jesus answered this man with these words. Verse 20. The young man answered and said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what are I still lack? Did the man understand the depth of what it is to love and the spirit of the law? No, not really. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And point number six here, the ruler recognized that outward obedience cannot satisfy the heart. He said, what do I still lack? I've done all of these things, I've kept the commandment, and there's still something missing in my heart. You see, you can try to keep all the rules. And do all the things that you need to do. But if Jesus is not in your heart, there is no peace. There is no joy. There is no satisfaction. And the man recognized that. He wanted something more. Point number seven, peace comes from the surrender of self. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor. Point number eight, surrender of self is only possible by coming to Christ. Jesus said, and come follow me. Friends, that's the most important part of this whole passage. Come follow me. That's the key. Come follow me. In the book Desire of Ages, we have a commentary on this story that we just read. The Redeemer longed to create in him, that's the young man, that discernment which would enable him to see the necessity of heart devotion and Christian goodness. Christ read the ruler's heart. Only one thing he lacked, but that was of a vital principle. He needed the love of God in his soul. This lack, unless supplied, would prove fatal to him. His whole nature would become corrupted. That's what he needed, the love of Jesus in his heart. You see, everywhere... There are people who are looking for something that they do not have. They are longing for a power that will give them victory over sin, a power that will give them self-control and peace. Well, wouldn't it be great if you could somehow come up with a health food supplement, if you like, that you could take three times a day, and as a result, you would have all of this power to gain victory over sin. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> You could just eat this certain kind of food and boom, you're a new person. You have a new heart. You have victory. People are longing for something that will change them. Rarely change them. Something that will satisfy the longings of their heart. That power, friends, is Christ. He alone can change the heart and bring peace to the soul. Many have a knowledge of the truth, but know not the power of the truth. Why? Because they don't go to Jesus to receive the help that they need from Him. That's the problem. It's not that Jesus is unwilling to give the help, but they don't come to Jesus to receive the help. Now here's the essence of what I want to say today. Today I want all of us to leave this church knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, how do I come to Jesus? That's my goal. Because if we can be clear on how we ought to come to Jesus, then we can receive from Jesus the help that he wants to give us. Then he can change our heart. So that's the goal. Keep that in mind as we study. John chapter 5 verse 39. Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Three points on this verse. Number one, Bible knowledge alone will save no one. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, you think you have eternal life in them, but something is lacking. Point number two, eternal life is through Christ. Point number three, in order to have eternal life, one must come to Jesus. Again, the book Steps to Christ, page 23. Notice this, very profound. How shall a man be just with God? How shall a sinner be made righteous? It is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God, with holiness. But how are we to come to Christ? 
Many are asking the same question, as did the multitude on the day of Pentecost when, convicted of sin, they cried out, What shall we do? What must I do to be saved? Now, in this paragraph, there are three questions. Did you see them? The first two questions are answered in the paragraph. The third question is not answered. It's expanded on, and it's not until later in the same passage that the answer is given. What is the first question? Question number one, how shall a man be just with God? Question number two, how shall the sinner be made righteous? Well, the answer to question number one, how shall a man be just with God, is this part. It is through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God. To be made just with God is to be brought into harmony with God. The theological term there is to be justified. So it's through Christ that we are justified. And the second question, how shall a sinner be made righteous? The answer here, it is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God or holiness. Through Christ we are brought into holiness, that is sanctification. We are sanctified. To be sanctified means to be set apart for a holy use. But the third question, and the most important question, is this one, but how are we to come to Christ? Now, of course, the answer is not given in these, in these two lines here. Rather, it's repeated, and the question is, what shall we do? Now, the answer to this is given by Peter on the day of Pentecost, the first word of Peter's answer was repent. At another time, shortly afterwards, he said, Repent and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. Repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. So how are we to come to Christ? Peter says it has to do with repentance. Coming to Christ involves repentance. Okay, point number two. Repentance includes a sorrow for sin and a turning away from sin. Now an example of genuine repentance, probably one of the clearest examples of this, is found in Psalm 51. This is David, and he's earnestly asking God for forgiveness. Notice the things that he says. Psalm 51, beginning here in verse 10. David said, creating me what kind of a heart? A clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Look at verse 12. Restore unto me what? What's that? The joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. So what are the three things that repentance involves? Number one, a repentant person seeks a clean heart. So when we come to Jesus, we need to come to Jesus in a spirit of repentance. What is it that we need to seek from Christ? We need to seek a clean heart. What is the second thing that we need to seek from Christ? A repentant person seeks the Holy Spirit. David said, do not take your spirit from me. So we ask for a clean heart. We also ask in Jesus to give us the Holy Spirit. What's the third thing that we need to ask of Jesus? A repentant person seeks the joy of salvation. So ask Jesus to give you joy, to give you the joy of salvation. Back to Steps to Christ. Just here is a point on which many err, talking about coming to Jesus. And hence they fail of receiving the help that Christ desires to give them. They think that they cannot come to Christ unless they first repent. But must the sinner wait until he has repented before he can come to Jesus? The Bible does not teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ. Now, the invitation of Christ has been referred to here is what Jesus said when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So must we repent before we go to Jesus? She says, no, the Bible does not teach that. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. We can no more repent without the Spirit of Christ awakening the conscience then we can't be pardoned without Christ. This, of course, is emphasized in Acts chapter 5. Again, we have the Apostle Peter, and he says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered. Look how clear he is on that. <laughs> and hanged on a tree. 